I am Bill Cartwright with Living Right with Bill Cartwright. And this is the Stress Mastery Podcast, where we take you from the science to the spirituality of stress mastery. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Stress Mastery Podcast. I am Bill Cartwright and I am here with the super millennial David Barreto. How you doing, Big Dave? I'm doing good. How was your Monday? It's good. Busy oh. as always. Always something to do. How was Millennial Monday? Millennials was, joining in? Yeah, we like I said, we had uh, two new new members join in into the community, and uh, we're starting some of the dialogue that's in there, and it's gonna get really good. Excellent, excellent. So this week, our topic is the power of thoughts. In today's health huddles, we're gonna switch it up a little bit and discuss healing, health, and thoughts. You ready? Let's do it. So. Here's some facts. The medical establishment has been proving that our mind and its beliefs can heal the body for decades now. And it's called the placebo effect. (laughs) It is a fact that patients that partake in clinical trials show stunning results. Many receive nothing but sugar pills, saline injections, even fake surgeries. We've talked about them on the show but they believe they were getting the new wonder drug or a miracle surgery. And the results that their bodies were getting better that 18% 18 to 80% of the time they would improve under the placebo. That's a lot of percentage. And it's important to understand that our beliefs, which produce our thoughts, are as, if not more important, than diet or exercise. Yeah. You agree? For sure. It's that powerful. We see it, right? So how powerful is the mind? This is an interesting um, story. In 2002, Merck, the pharmaceutical giant, Mm -hmm. you know Merck, they were falling behind it. They were falling behind their competition and they had several drugs that were about to expire. When a drug expires, that means that they can then, it's like a free... It's a free-for-all. They can make generics of them, right? They lose control of the drug. And they had already, they needed a hit drug and they needed it fast because their business was about to take a hit. So they were testing an experimental antidepressant with the code name MK869. And this was the company's dream drug. A new kind of medication that exploited the brain chemistry in a in an innovative way to promote feelings of well-being. Now, the drug tested brilliantly early on. No major side effects, as Merck touted it as its game-changing potential of this new drug. Behind the scenes, though, Merck was in a panic. As MK869 results started to unravel. It was true that many of the test subjects treated with the medication reported that their anxiety and feelings of hopelessness had lifted. But so did nearly the same number who had taken the placebo reported similar results. And so the subjects that took the look-alike sugar pill were getting the same results as the ones that took the drug. And ultimately, Merck's drug failed. Isn't that amazing, right? And honestly, as I research this out, this is very common. The placebo effect is destroying the release of countless of new drugs. The industry is actually in kind of a crisis. And one official said, it's not that the old old medications are getting weaker. It is as if the placebo effect is somehow getting stronger. (laughs) So let's let's take a closer look just how powerful our thoughts and the mind really are. So when we look at the placebo effect, the roots, and this is interesting where it came from. How did all this start when people, because now to pass a drug, it has to go through a double blind study. It has to go through a placebo. Well, the roots of the placebo effect discovery can be actually traced back to World War II. As Allied forces stormed the beaches of southern Italy. There was a nurse assisting Dr. Henry Beecher. The U.S. troops were under heavy fire from the Germans. The nurse ran into an issue when the morphine supply ran low. 
So she decided to fill her syringe with salt water, but told the soldiers they were getting the potent painkiller. To her and to Dr. Beecher's shock, the injection relieved the soldiers' agony and pain, and most importantly, it prevented them from going into shock. So Beecher, after the war, returned to Harvard and became one of the nation's leading medical reformers. He was inspired by the nurse's deception and he launched what would become the protocols used to test the effectiveness of medication. The double-blind studies are linked to Dr. Beecher. Now, Big Pharma has worried hard, you know, about this because they're really, they're, they're not doing well and they've worked to get around the testing. And the medical field never wanted to take the time to actually understand why the placebo effect worked. Mm -hmm. All they were trying to do is get around the testing. And there was no government agency willing to pay to look at the placebo effect. I find that amazing, by the way. Mm -hmm. But there was one doctor, a neuroscientist named Fabrizio Bendetti. Yes, he's Italian. Mm -hmm. And he first became interested in the placebo effect in the in mid-90s while researching pain. He was surprised how patients in the placebo group were actually doing better than the ones taking the pain medication in the test groups. And he also took notice that the ones that no one cared about this result. No one cared. They only focused on the drugs. And most doctors thought that the placebo effect was some psycho babble stuff and had little to do with medicine. Right? The psychological part of it. So Dr. Bendetti would spend over 15 years of researching the biochemical reactions that are responsible for the placebo effect. And there, these same reactions are responsible for the self-healing results of the body. So the placebo activated opioids, 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 not only relieve pain, they also modulate heart rate and respiration. And he found the neurotransmitter, dopamine, when released by the placebo treatment, held improved motor functions in Parkinson's patients. So he actually got Parkinson's patients to re decrease the tremors by using a placebo. And what he calls, Dr. Bendetti found, he calls it the placebo mechanisms when released. And remember, this is a sugar pill can elevate mood, sharpen cognitive ability, alleviate digestive disorders, relieve insomnia, and limit stress by limiting the secretion of the hormones, cortisol, and insulin. Placebo effect. What do you think of that? Yeah, I've, I've learned quickly that the, the mind plays a huge role in um, pain and things like that. Uh, I know a while back, if you guys listened for a long time, you know I went through a really bad tooth. I cracked a tooth. And uh, the pain was so bad. One time I was driving, I didn't have painkillers. I didn't have nothing. And at the time, cold water would numb it. And I was in the middle of traffic and had nothing. And I just focused on that pain and like try to meditate kind of driving. And the pain went away. And it was the most incredible thing because I was like, I stopped that pain with nothing in about 10 minutes. Yeah, because you focused on the pain. You stopped yeah. fighting it. So the question is, what turns a fake dummy pill into a catalyst for relieving pain, anxiety, depression, sexual dysfunction, and even the tremors of Parkinson's disease? Well, the answer is our brain's own healing mechanism. That this, When you take a placebo, it is unleashed by the belief that a phony medication works. Our beliefs, our thoughts can either create a healing effect or they can create disease. And we reveal our beliefs and our thoughts by the words we speak. When we affirm illness, we create illness. When we affirm pain, we create pain. When we affirm depression, we create depression. We do this all the time with stress and fatigue. I'm so stressed out. I'm so tired. What happens? The body actually goes into those states. And so in shift coaching, we have a lesson where I, it's part of the, the first 12 weeks where I start to focus on the evil twin of the placebo effect. Have you ever heard of the nocebo effect? 
No. You never heard of it, right? Well, in shift coaching, which you're going to be going through, by the way, just so you know, you should have never volunteered for that abuse. <laughs> but it's actually a lesson that I put in there. And um, I think Peggy just went through it. Jim went through it. The no, It's called the nocebo effect. The nocebo effect does the opposite of the placebo effect. Where the pl placebo effect creates positive reactions. The nocebo effect is the negative reaction from a harmless treatment. The nocebo effect is when one experienced side effects that they believe was caused by a treatment and they are not real. So they actually get the side effects from a placebo because they told there would be side effects. <laughs> you know, so now understand the nocebo effect is real, right? The person is experiencing real symptoms. So the nocebo effect creates expectations of harm. A patient's expectations of treatment clearly influences how a treatment works. Now, I saw this in the clinic. We actually did genetic testing on the patient to see how the patient's body would react to certain medications before we gave them the medication. So we wanted to make sure, remember, my partners were cardiologists. We wanted to make sure the medication would work, right? So one of those tests were for statins to see how their body would react to statins. Do you remember what this main side effect the statins were? Cramps. Right. Pain. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And so statins cause muscle pain. Well, they cause muscle pain in patients that can't produce the coenzyme Q10 when they're taking them. Mm -hmm. Well, we can actually test if their body can do that. And we would see that they would test negative, but if the person believed they were going to get muscle pain, they got muscle pain every single time they got the side effects. And the nocebo effect has become very, very powerful and strong because of Michael Singer. <laughs> what did Michael Singer do? WebMD. Created WebMD. So now everybody, they create their own nocebo effect, and it's very powerful, especially when coming, this is important, from a medical professional. If you should be susceptible to negative suggestions, right? So let's let's just look at the nocebo effect of gluten. Okay, everybody's going to get mad now. And I can already hear it in the community. You think Linda's listening to this show? <laughs> Here we go, right? First, what is gluten? It's derived, it's a protein derived from wheat, rye, and barley, and can be destructive for some people with celiac disease. You understand that, right? Yeah. But many people claim all the negative side effects from gluten, even though they don't have the antibodies from celiac disease. So the nocebo effect would be these people feeling better when they cut the gluten from their diets. Correct? You're with me. Mm -hmm. So they did a study. And this study is very famous. Google it. And they have proven the nocebo effect of gluten. In this one study, they tested participants who had a gluten-free diet for six months or longer. None of them had celiac. Randomly, they were given two packets of flour, um, pack A or pack B, and each participant would use the flour in their foods for 10 days. Then they would go back to their regular diet for two weeks, and then they were given the opposite pack for the next 10-day period. 34% correctly identified the gluten flour. And these were actually the people that scored high on the symptom questionnaire. So they already had the symptom, you know, so think about that. Now, 50% reported gluten symptoms when they didn't have the flour with gluten in it. 50%, right? Now, the danger of this nocebo is that the gluten-free diet is a heavily marketed. It's the latest fad in the diet industry. And so the food industry has created gluten-free products, right? Foods. And many times, actually, these gluten-free foods are less helpful than the original food because many of them have more sugar. Yeah. Correct? So I just want to put that out there, and I'm not saying... Now, here's... Think about it, though. If you cut gluten from your diet and you feel better, God bless you. Who cares? But understand how powerful your mind is. 
Right? Yeah, it could go both ways. <laughs> right? That's the but big understand thing. it because these people were tested and physiologically they should not have had any reaction. And the ones who had the reaction were the ones that believed it the most. So what do I tell somebody? If, if you feel better off gluten, don't eat gluten. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't, that's not the point. You got to understand that our thoughts stem from our health beliefs. And remember, most of our health beliefs were passed on from the previous generations. Where does another group of our health beliefs come from, David? Family. Family, generation. Mm -hmm. You know where else they come from? Marketing. Oh, yeah. And it's huge. Oh, yeah. It's marketing. I'll never forget the fat-free era when snack well cookies and lines of people would be standing in a grocery store to get snack wells because for the first time, you could eat cookies and not get fat because they didn't have any fat in them. And people believed it, right? So there are studies showing that women who believe they were prone to heart disease were four times more likely to die. It was not because they had a poor diet or high blood pressure or cholesterol. They simply had a belief that they would have heart disease. Your health is tied directly to your beliefs. Do you believe you will be on medications for the rest of your life? Do you believe the doctor's prognosis? So I had a, a wellness client some weeks ago explaining to him the processes of what stress mastery and the pause plan diet does in reversing disease. And I said, and these are the medications that you're going to get off. And he argued with me. No, I can't get off blood pressure medication. I have this. I have that. I have this. I go, but we had hundreds of people i want to say thousands i, say I know but i'm not i'm just going to say hundreds of people in the same exact state you're in older get off medication mm -hmm. it's science based but he was adamant that it couldn't happen and these are the things that we deal with every day so how do you work with a patient like that slowly mm -hmm. you got to build trust because once they believe they can get off medication, I can guarantee they're going to get off medication. Yeah. So this is what it means. Are you motivated to try to activate your body's innate self-repair mechanism? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Are you willing to change your mind to change your thoughts? Are you willing to take that step? Now, we've been talking about unity, right? And Charles Fillmore and Myrtle Fillmore are the founders of Unity. And it was founded, the Unity organization was founded in the late 1800s. But do you know the story of Myrtle Fillmore? No. It's an amazing story. So Myrtle Fillmore, along with Charles Fillmore, founded the Unity movement that bears the Unity churches. Well, Myrtle Fillmore had become very ill and she had grown up she had always had health problems and she had become very ill with tuberculosis and she had serious abdominal issues now she reached to the point where the doctors and medication had ceased to give her any relief and then she attended a church service that convinced her the of the power of self-healing and then she remembered back as a child she had been told since she was a small child, that she had inherited her sickness from her father. So Myrtle had this flash, this intuition, an awakening of sorts. And she decided, she had this flash that she wanted to try something new, that she believed she could talk to the life or life energy in every part of her body, that she could actually communicate with her body. And she was convinced that she could direct her body to do what she wanted it to do. And she states in her story, I told the life in my liver that it was not weak. It was full of vigor and energy. She then told her stomach it was not weak, but strong and intelligent. She told her limbs they were active and strong. And as she went through every body part, she also asked 
for forgiveness for her foolish and ignorant statements that she had made all her life toward her body being weak and diseased. And she kept this up, even though at first there was nothing. She kept it up and kept it up until her body responded. Myrtle would go on to make a complete recovery. Myrtle and her husband, Charles Fillmore, would go on to find that this healing processes worked, that her mind was stronger than her illness. And this would be the foundation that would go on to build unity. So Myrtle taught three aspects to her transformation and her tools for healing. She said, number one, we must claim that our inheritance is divine and not earthly. She taught that we must identify those thoughts we cling to that are very, that are creating these very strong barriers to what we really seek and want. And she taught that we are more than our genetics. This is in the early 1900s, right? That was number one. We have to claim that we are defined. Number two, we must honor our body. She taught that honoring our body is both an activity of our mental attitudes and words. And this is combined with the physical activity of rest, exercise, and nourishment. I love that she used the word nourishment instead of diet. Right? So she said to honor your body, you had to honor the body both in the activity of our mental attitudes and words and the physical activity of rest, exercise, and nourishment. And then number three, forgiveness. Myrtle taught that we had to let go of resentment and judgment through forgiveness if we truly wanted our body to be healed. So we here at Stress Mastery teach all three of these steps. We talk about how we must split the eyes, the eye of identification, eye of presence, correct? Mm -hmm. We teach that we must master the body, correct? Stress response, how to manage it. And we teach that we must forgive to break the hold of the ego, which is anchored in the guilt energy. So our thoughts stem from our beliefs. Our beliefs can be limiting. I'm the sickly type. I have poor genetics. My family gets cancer. Or it can be empowering. I am spirit, spirit I am, free from all limits, free to forgive. So David, we're talking about the power of thoughts. Let's talk a little bit more on this subject. What are your thoughts of Myrtle Fillmore? I think that that's a really good example. You know, when you look at somebody's life, who can it be so extreme? And if it can, you know, literally flip somebody's life around in those extreme cases, what can it do in our small day to day? You know, just the constant affirmations of like what she's saying mm -hmm. and really believing it along with working on yourself and, you know, going through the Green Folks Power Hour and letting go. And, you know, with all the name of your ego, imagine attaching that along with feeling not only that you can control, you know, your thoughts with, you know, how you and your ego go against, but having complete control of the inside of your body. Yes, you do. And I, I'm, I'm on a one that I'm, I've done it. Mm -hmm. So I, I can tell you, I eradicated diabetes from my, my, from my body. Even though I had it under control for many, many years, I never let it go. Because I was told I would always be diabetic. Mm -hmm. Until one crazy Dr. Brian said, <laughs> why don't you try to get rid of it? I go, what do you mean get rid of it? Let's stop the medication. And then one of the most important things I did was I stopped making that statement. I am a diabetic. Nope, mm -hmm. not anymore. Remember, I went and started talking. I'll be on stage talking about the body has issues with sugars. The body was diagnosed. With, and I separated myself from it. And sure enough, the diabetes was gone. And I don't have it anymore. And to the point where he would sign off on that. Right? And so I do believe in, in, in the genetic thing. The genetics that I have, man, my poor sister's four foot 11. has got to be going close to 270, 300 pounds. That's our genetics. But your genetics are overruled by your habits. Mm -hmm. Your habits are programs you carry in your subconscious mind. 
And your beliefs are what cause your thoughts. How do you know what you're thinking, Dave? It's what you're saying. Yeah. If you're talking about your pain, then you believe that you are in pain. If you're talking about how tired you are, well, then your belief is your thoughts are how tired you are. You're going to get, and we talk about our thoughts and the power of our thoughts. Well, your thoughts are stemming from your programs, which are your beliefs. And those thoughts are stemming from your subconscious mind, which controls your body. So you can see how we can be trapped in that. And so if an authority, why do you think all the commercials put somebody who's touting anything. I don't care if it's a knee brace. I don't care if it's a, a diet pill. I don't care if it's some essential oil. You know what they put them in? They put them in a white coat and they wrap a stethoscope around their neck. Yeah. Why do you think they do that? Yeah, if you listen to authority, that's what we were taught. We were programmed that that person knows. And if your subconscious believes that that pill is going to do it, you're going to get the placebo effect. Yeah, the, the, the way that marketing and stuff like that, I remember a few years ago, well, about six, seven years ago, I remember my dad telling me that he stopped drinking soda because of aspartame. He was getting aspartame poisoning. And I was like, what? I remember you drinking soda since I was a kid. What's the difference now? It hasn't changed. But a study came out online, and he read it, and all of a sudden, like, I'm bloated because of this, and I'm this, and this, and this. And sure enough, that study was actually for only certain people with like a genetic factor <laughs> and i was there yesterday two days ago and he was drinking normal soda that had aspartame and i i it clicks to me now it's to say he just read it online there yep. was no science behind it now if you get science done and stuff like that like you apoe guys yeah. it's not just saying it once you know it you know right. But once you say it in your head, it's real. So that is a good one, Ge genetic-wise. So if you have the, the gene, the APOE gene, right? Your body's genetics are going to work a certain way if that genetic is activated. Mm -hmm. And it's activated if you are eating the wrong combinations of food. If you don't, it doesn't activate. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the thing. When we talked about celiac, I mean, the gluten thing... <laughs> I don't know. I mean, Linda says she feels better, but Linda does have some autoimmune issues. So it's possible, even though she doesn't have celiac, that it could be because it would be autoimmune. I don't know. And I don't care. She feels better. Don't eat gluten. But yeah, that's exactly how I look but, at it. If right? it has a benefit to you, yes, I mean, maybe it's just causing about. somebody to be more strict on their diet or maybe. be more conscious about it. Whatever the case is, it's just... <laughs> but watch yourself because yes. a nocebo is the opposite of the placebo. So you can actually talk yourself into symptoms. Mm -hmm. If you look at something, they were giving people they were giving people placebos and telling them that, well, these are the side effects you can expect. <laughs> they were getting the side effects. Which is kind of cruel, I think, when yeah. you think about testing, but you're, they were testing the mind. They weren't testing a drug. Mm -hmm. You know? And so if people are taking these medications for depression and they're getting such good results with the placebo that the medication couldn't be released? Is it possible that we're maybe over-medicating people with, um, with depression? Is it possible that all the ADD stuff is just what we believe? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not for everybody, but I don't know. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, and I even think it for... I, I take it to the sense of like, let's say you do have, you know, a, a certain level of depression or ADD or something like that. And medication is that. But what happens if you're taking the medication and you're changing your mindset versus right. just relying on the medication? I mean, that right there, we've, we talked about it when we talked about like depression a long time ago. Some people have a chemical imbalance. Yep. But what happens when you combine that with... We the thoughts you get you get even exactly. better i have i have had clients like that mm -hmm. and they just take less medication exactly and so the people that are on blood pressure medication i'm telling you you can get off blood pressure medication the only reason i can say that so boldly is because i saw hundreds of people get off it good track record. some people the statins you can't get off if your body produces it that way then it produces it that way but most people are given this cholesterol lowering drug because they believe that's the answer 
And then once you're on medications, it's affecting your body, people. You've got to understand that. If you don't need a medication, it's still affecting your body. So the less medication we can have. So the power of thoughts in our health is very, very real. If you're on a diet and you're saying, this diet doesn't work, I can't lose weight, guess what? You're not, losing. You're not gonna lose. It happens all the time to people. That's why when we were talking about getting through those testing periods yesterday for millennials, you gotta get through the testing periods. You're gonna hit a plateau in these things. If you can't go through a plateau, this is what you won't get long-term results. This is why education is so important. Mm -hmm. That's it for today's show. Our mission here is to create a shift in the planet. You can join us on this mission by simply like, share, and subscribe. The links are right below the show. And if you do like, share, and subscribe, I guarantee that your life will be better. It's been proven. <laughs> right? Or it's a really good placebo. As always, until next time, stay inspired. inspired.